and I'm a board member from ACC, and I'm really honored today to present um, in honor of International Women's Day, a presentation about embracing equity for women in the workplace. And um, this presentation is brought to you by our wonderful sponsor, Jackson Lewis, a law firm that is really focused on labor and employment. And so today on our panel, we have a partner at Jackson Lewis, Michelle Meek, as well as an associate, Stephanie Keurig, and then ACC board member and our resident um, in-house employment expert, Hannah Cole. So I will turn it over to all of these amazing women for today's presentation. Thank you so much, Alexa. We appreciate it. And we appreciate everyone joining us here today in the month of women's history, one day past International Women's Day uh, for our topic today, which is strategies for promoting gender and pay equality in the workplace. Uh, so let's start out talking about International Women's Day. We're one day past. Um, International Women's Day is a global day. Uh, it crosses borders, crosses organizations uh, to celebrate the social, economic, cultural, and political achievements of women. And importantly, it's also a day that's a call to action, right? And I think that we really see this call to action in the theme for the 2023 International Women's Day, which is embrace equity. Uh, this theme is one that crosses over very well with our work with labor and employment, um, and certainly with the hot topics um, in this area of the law around pay, pay equity and pay transparency. Uh, International Women's Day recognizes this important issue as well. Uh, one of their missions, among several very important uh, missions for advancing women in society, uh, one is to forge inclusive work cultures where women's careers thrive and their achievements are celebrated. Uh, so we'll keep this uh, theme, this mission in mind as we go through our presentation today. Uh, and of course, as we celebrate on March 8th, uh, we'll also continue to talk about how we can benefit women in the workplace throughout the entire year. Uh, so let me run you through our agenda for today. Our first major umbrella topic is diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workplace. Uh, and the challenges that we face in implementing um, and maintaining these policies when faced with implicit bias. Uh, our second major topic is pay equity and pay transparency legislation uh, on a federal and uh, California specific basis. And as we go through each of these major topics, we'll talk about best practices for management. Uh, Hannah in particular has great, some great insight into the practical implementation uh, of DEI, gender equity policies, pay equity policies. So we'll be turning to her for that insight throughout our presentation. So let's start first with our major umbrella topic of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Certainly this is no mystery to this group. Uh, certainly this is a group that recognizes the importance of diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workplace. Uh, we show here just a, a select you know, non-exhaustive list of our social identities, uh, these membership in these groups uh, that people are bringing to the workplace as employees, as coworkers, as bosses. Uh, and as we look at this list, we wanna think about the intersectionality here, right? Uh, that people can be members of one, multiple of these groups. Uh, and these are the valued backgrounds and insights that are coming to us from our diverse coworkers uh, in our workplace today. Um, and so certainly we don't stop at the idea of a diverse workplace. Uh, I know that our goal is an inclusive workplace, right? A workplace where we recognize uh, these important social identities uh, and create a workplace where belonging, um, where these identities, the uniqueness of these identities uh, are celebrated uh, for the value and benefit that they bring uh, to our everyday workplace. However, as we look at this group of identities and we, we understand the shared commitment towards DEI in the workplace, I think it's also important for us to recognize that uh, DEI efforts um, and our efforts in terms of policies, trainings, commitments in our workplaces can sometimes and oftentimes be undermined by unconscious bias. Uh, and so when we talk about unconscious bias, uh, unfortunately, there's you know, seven, eight different kinds that just kind of roll off at the, the top of the head. 
uh, we talk about availability bias, right? The idea that uh, what's more available in your memory um, helps you to address any situation. Uh, we talk about uh, the illusion of objectivity bias, a particularly dangerous one, right? Because the more that we think that we are addressing DEI issues, that we've got them in the forefront, uh, it sells us into a sense of complacency uh, to where perhaps we're missing some objective criteria or improvements that can be made. Uh, there's confirmation bias, right? The idea that we look for or we find what we look for. Um, and unfortunately, you know, these are just parts of human nature. It's certainly an innate situation uh, that can cause us to have uh, these challenges to diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workplace. Uh, all things being equal, we find that unconscious bias often results uh, in different treatment between genders in the workplace, uh, and particularly important for today's presentation, uh, often results in higher pay for male employees. Um, it's certainly not just an issue of salary transparency. Uh, we see this unconscious bias as pervasive of the entire employment process from recruitment uh, through opportunities for advancement and beyond. Uh, and we'll talk about where some of those challenges lie. But as we go out through, go through today, uh, you'll find us saying over and over again that we can combat this unconscious bias. We can take steps uh, to move beyond uh, the issues created by these very natural sort of human nature unconscious biases by creating objective criteria, right? Being very intentional in creating our processes at work uh, based upon clear criteria. Uh, sometimes this looks like a market analysis. Sometimes this looks like a job audit, uh, both for retire requirements and duties and also pay. Um, and so conducting this unconscious bias on an organization-wide or just on a personal reflective basis is incredibly important, right? It's an ongoing commitment, uh, which is part of our ongoing commitment towards DEI and advancement of women in the workplace. Uh, so let's talk about some more of these issues just uh, in specific, uh, starting with implicit bias in recruitment and employment. As we mentioned, this is an issue that is pervasive from the beginning of employment uh, through you know, the life of an employment at a workplace, uh, the issue often isn't overt discrimination, right? It's not intentional, explicit acts uh, or words, but rather it's this unconscious behavior that may impact uh, or harm an applicant as they try to join a workplace in a number of ways. Um, Hannah, did you wanna talk about how this has played out? Um, sure. Thanks, Michelle. So um, at BD, we do conscious inclusion training. And one of the uh, examples I give to sort of bring this to life is a personal one. So for background, I went to uh, my, my state college in Nevada when I graduated from high school because I knew I was going to be an English major and my state college was free. So I thought that was a pretty solid bet coming out with an English degree. And then when I decided to go to law school, I went to the school that gave me um, pretty much the most money I could get because I didn't want to be tied down or forced into decisions about my career based on, you know, uh, student debt. Um, and when I got into a place where I was working at a law firm and I was looking at resumes, I would find myself kind of rolling my eyes when I would see people coming from very prestigious schools because I made very solid life decisions that led me away from those types of schools. And looking at these resumes, I thought, well, they clearly don't know what they're doing. <laughs> and it wasn't um, you know, a protected category bias. And it took me a little bit to realize that I was discounting what is you know, uh, objectively impressive on paper because it didn't match up with my own life choices. And so it forced me to really just slow down and take into account the resumes and really look at it without uh, a view of what would I have done or what did I do and how does this differ? And so I share that with managers a lot because that type of bias happens and we don't always notice it. For me, it was, it was a little bit easy because it seems uh, sort of obvious that we shouldn't be throwing away resumes with people, you know, people coming from Harvard or Yale, <laughs> that is a little bit perhaps a uh, short-sighted. And so it was a little bit of an obvious flag for me 
that this was happening. But um, we just remind employ uh, managers when they're making these decisions in recruiting and, and in performance that a lot of it comes down to slowing down because that will um, engage the more analytical portion of our brain and not the quick, you know, fight or flight type portion of our brain. And that allows for analysis, which allows for us to make um, better decisions that are less prone to mistake. Yeah, thank you, Hannah. From one English major to another. <laughs> uh, definitely. Uh, right, that's what it's all about, right, is taking that time to recognize that these implicit biases, based on our own life experiences uh, or what we've observed, uh, do exist and taking time to interrupt that pattern building activity uh, to think very carefully and critically about the actions that we're taking. Uh, we've got just a list here uh, of other areas where we would recommend that you really take a good look and a hard look about uh, how these opportunities are conducted, how these processes are conducted at your workplace, uh, because we find that these are really areas wherein these implicit biases uh, can come into play. Uh, particularly when we're talking about networking opportunities, right, or opportunities for advancement. I think we've all heard for a long time that business is done on the golf course, business is done at the steak dinner after the golf course, um, and that maybe those are more traditionally male activities. Um, of course, making strides towards changing that, uh, but certainly as we're thinking about uh, what networking opportunities look like, what opportunities for advancement look like, uh, you know, what opportunities for professional de development look like. Uh, it's important to keep in mind that we are being inclusive uh, and recognizing that we do have these diverse uh, identities and histories and backgrounds that should be taken into consideration when we uh, are running our businesses. So let's talk about some of these best practices, right? Uh, this is one that we've already, Hannah and I both have touched on, and that is when uh, we're considering how we are conducting ourselves at work, how we are hiring, how we're engaging with our employees. Uh, you can never go wrong with leading with inclusion, right? Of returning yourself to your uh, company's policies surrounding diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, returning yourself to your personal commitment to those values. Uh, and taking the time to think about your intention around uh, whatever it may be that you're wanting to accomplish. You know, for example, if we're unrolling a new evaluation process, uh, certainly would be an area of great uh, consideration, right? And part of that consideration into how making sure that your employees are performing well, uh, that you're encouraging retention in a future at that company, uh, it looks like recognizing diverse employees and their strengths and areas of improvement. Uh, so taking that time to consider those issues so that you can lead with intention and model it for your team. Um, and then certainly building in, uh, you know, areas that you can work for a double check, right? You can audit your decisions for bias. Uh, most importantly here, you want to embed structure in your process, right? This is something that should be considered in everything that you've done. Uh, it's something that will be considered and put in place with uh, multiple stakeholders who can talk about objective criteria and a structure in your workplace processes that recognizes DE and I. Um, so how do we do that? Uh, structural changes. Uh, we want to look at our incredibly important structures, right? Our hiring processes, mentorship programs, uh, performance overviews, um, and think about how can these different um, workplace obligations, practices, be infused with this commitment to DE&I uh, so that we can further this idea of equity uh, among men and women, among genders in the workplace. Um, I'll turn it back over to Hannah, who has some really important thoughts on this. Great. Thank you so much. So just for, for folks that are thinking, what, we can, what can we do internally at our organizations, um, I'll share some of the things that BD does as part of this, um, you know, this best practice. One is we have an annual uh, compensation audit, annual pay audit. And I think one of the challenges, aside from all the you know privilege questions when you're looking at pay audits, is that uh, of data validation. So we have certain, um, so for folks who don't know, BD is a um, medical device and technology company. We have um, positions ranging from manufacturing um, associates all the way to scientists and sales and 
um, we're global. So we've got 70,000 employees worldwide. So we have a really wide breadth of um, employees. And when it comes to, for example, our hourly manufacturing associates, um, pay will vary based on site. And sometimes it'll be things like um, training that happens. If you get trained on an additional line that can result in a pay increase or um, time and role or productivity me metrics. And that's not always captured in the data. So when we go to do these audits, we'll see this really wide variation among individuals in the same job title. And the reasons aren't clearly documented in the data. So that's part of the process is making sure that we're digging in and capturing the reasons for the compensation so that when we do the audits, we're actually know what we're looking at. Some of the other things we do um, for recruiting, we require diverse pools of associates uh, or of candidates so that we know we're not just looking at one demographic when we're recruiting. We're also in the process of doing um, an audit of our, of our talent uh, performance metrics and our systems that support that. So when we look at performance ratings and potential ratings, which helps designate whether someone is, is on the path upward or they're good in their current role. And we look at those to see whether there is any disparity in the way that they are be, being utilized for folks of different genders or of different ethnicities. And once we have um, that data, we're actually going out and, and having focus groups to talk to people because, again, data will only tell you so much. And um, this additional step is cumbersome and lengthy and potentially a little bit scary because we're going to be talking to our employees very directly about what their experience is. But without doing that, we're sort of missing that key um, experience level that only actual people can tell us and data cannot. So there's a lot of really good work that can be done, but um, very little of it is easy. <laughs> right. It's the work at the beginning that will have the payoff at the end. <laughs> right. And so as you're reviewing your structural changes, your processes for these equity concerns, uh, we really recommend that you embed in those processes what we call structural interrupters. Right, as you're determining uh, best ways to handle your evaluation process, think about how you can build in processes uh, and define steps which will prevent this pervasive unconscious bias and keep your organization in line with your diversity, equity, and inclusion goals. Uh, we've got some examples here, uh, and they really boil down towards exactly what Hannah shared, and that is uh, putting these uh, protections and processes in place in a very thoughtful manner uh, with input uh, at all levels of your organization to make sure that uh, you're truly addressing equity issues in the workplace. Uh, so we've discussed uh, our first umbrella issue of uh, the importance of aligning our workplace policies and structures and procedures uh, with your workplaces uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion goals uh, as a general matter. We want to turn now uh, towards pay equity and pay transparency in specific to talk about how we see these overarching goals play out uh, in the legislation around this area. Uh, so I'll turn it over to Stephanie now to discuss uh, pay equity and pay transparency. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, so just jumping on to pay equity, what is it? Well, it's this concept of fairness and ensuring that employees are paid uh, based on legitimate factors and not because they're a, you know, a member of a protected class, someone who's the opposite sex or another race or ethnicity. Uh, this can be a really complex practice for employers. You know, as Michelle explained, you can't just eliminate bias overnight. This is a process that has to be done at an individual level and at an organizational level. Uh, but what can employers do? Like Michelle and Hannah both touched on, you can weigh other factors such as the employee's education, work experience, and responsibilities of the position to ensure that they're being paid fairly. So there's pay equity and there's also the pay gap, which I'm sure everyone has heard about. Uh, and the pay gap is the difference um, 
the differences in pay between genders and race groups among all jobs. So not just position to position, but uh, organization wide. Um, so with pay gaps, we analyze all employees to determine how compensation compares and whether that's men versus women or members of a different protected class versus another. Uh, I'm sure you've all heard that for every $1 a man earns, a woman earns 82 cents. So this is the gender wage gap. Um, but as I mentioned, wage gaps can exist uh, at other levels, you know, based on racial or ethnic groups or other protected classes. So uh, as employers, we wanna ensure that there's not a pay gap in some other area. You don't wanna hyper-focus on just the gender um, aspect of it, but, but look at other areas as well. So some of the root causes of pay inequity, uh, unconscious bias, like Michelle discussed, um, too much discretion, discrepancies in starting salaries and salary negotiations. But these, these ideas are all interconnected. Uh, for example, a manager who has discretion to determine the pay of an employee, whatever unconscious biases they have are going to color the salary decisions, um, you know, hiring decisions, salary, promotion, all of that. And whether we're aware of them or not, these biases exist and they affect the way that we're interacting with other people um, as employers. And particularly when it comes to gender, women tend to have lower starting salaries than men when they first enter the workforce. Um, and this is partially due to the basic difference in how men and women negotiate. Men tend to be more competitive and assertive in salary negotiations, uh, where women are not always that way. And uh, yeah, a problem with that is these lower starting salaries for women can carry on throughout their careers, particularly if employers are basing salary decisions on what the employee made at a previous employer uh, or in a previous position. So. Uh, you know, obviously we want to, to end pay inequity to the extent that we can. Of course, this is a long ongoing process, um, but there are great consequences. So some of these consequences include litigation, which we'll, we'll discuss more here in a few minutes, um, the reputation and the public perception of the company, uh, you know, obviously this is a capitalist society. Competition is everything. And as employers, you wanna make sure that you're setting yourself apart in the right ways. Um, so we wanna make sure that, that the company's image is one that, that we're not paying employees differently based on their gender or some other reason. Uh, we want to make sure that we attract and retain good talent. Um, and, and part of that is ensuring that employees are paid based on merit and, uh, and not some other reason. So now we'll get into the pay transparency legislation. And here is just a quick snapshot timeline of pay equity laws as they stand right now. So back in the 1960s, we started with the Equal Pay Act and Title VII, um, but lately over the past six to seven years, there's been a lot of activity at the state level expanding pay equity and pay transparency laws. Um, as you see, it took us a really long time to get to where we are now. Uh, from 1963, when the Equal Pay Act went into effect till 2016, when California decided to do something about this. Um, so it's it's taken us a while to make some real progress, but as you can see from this chart, a lot of states are jumping on that bandwagon and making this a priority. So in general, pay transparency laws exist to ensure that applicants for jobs and employees who are already within positions know what they're being paid and know what they're being paid uh, comparatively to their peers. So these laws generally require employees to include salary ranges for positions in job postings um, and a description of the responsibilities in the posting as well. 
we'll get into specifically what California requires here in a minute. So lack of transparency, as I'm sure you can imagine, is a major cause of pay inequity historically. Um, after all, if we don't know that there's a problem or that there is this inequity in pay, we can't address it and we can't fix it. Um, so pay transparency, as I mentioned earlier, results in employees being able to see how they're being paid uh, relative to their peers. And competition in the, workplace, in the workplace affects employers' ability to attract and retain good employees. But by ensuring that your pay is equal, you're showing employees that you value them regardless of their gender, their race, or some other um, protected group. So the goal is to eliminate um, some of these biases and these inequities that do exist and put people on equal footing based on their merit. <clears throat> so at the federal level, we have the Equal Pay Act, which back in 1963 went into effect and essentially just required that men and women employed at the same company receive equal pay for equal work. The following year in 1964, um, Title VII expanded those protections of the Equal Pay Act and prohibited pay discrimination based on not just gender, but also race, color, religion, and national origin. And then finally, the NLRA applies to employees of private employers um, and provides that employees have the right to discuss their pay and communicate with their coworkers about how much they're making. And so here's just an overview of sort of what's been happening at the state level, um, laws that are gaining traction across the country, and uh, most importantly, emerging trends that we're seeing. So um, particularly here in California, there was some new legislation that went into effect this year that we'll talk about um, that requires more uh, pay reporting, transparency, opportunity transparency. Uh, so we're seeing that happen here and other states will likely follow which we'll also be monitoring. So in California, our Equal Pay Act, uh, it prohibits employers from paying employees who are performing what we call substantially similar work, different rates based on their gender, race, ethnicity, age, et cetera. So what is substantially similar work? Uh, the law defines it as work that is mostly similar in skill, effort, responsibility, and performed under similar working conditions. Um, so we're all lawyers. I'm sure most, if not all of us, have worked in law firms. Think of the legal assistants and the paralegals in your office. They're performing substantially similar work. And uh, we certainly wouldn't want to be paying one person more you know, a male legal assistant more than a female legal assistant, unless there's some other legitimate factor. So the California Equal Pay Act allows employers to, to pay different wage rates when there's some bona fide factors, such as seniority, experience, education, merit, um, or anything else besides sex, race, or ethnicity. And consistent with the National Labor Relations Act, under the Equal Pay Act, employers cannot prevent employees from discussing their pay. So effective January 1st of this, of this year, 2023, California Senate Bill 1162 imposed new pay transparency and pay data reporting requirements. <clears throat> So in terms of transparency, as of this year, employers who have 15 or more employees have to include the pay scale in any job posting within their company. Uh, the pay scale is the salary or hourly wage that an employer reasonably expects to pay for the position. Every employer, regardless of size, has to provide current employees with the pay scale for their current position if they request it. So uh, 
you know, this isn't just for new hires. This is your existing employees. If they come to you and say, hey, I want to know what the, what the pay scale is for my job, you have to provide that to them. And then there are also certain record keeping requirements. So employers have to maintain records of the job title and wage rate history for every employee throughout their employment, plus three years after that. Um, this record keeping portion is crucial for defending pay inequity and discrimination lawsuits. Uh, you want to be able to have this historical data to show what you've been paying and prove that it wasn't on some illegitimate basis. Um, and the Department of Labor Standards and Enforcement can inspect your records to see if there's a pattern of wage discrepancy. So you need to keep the records for those purposes as well. And with respect to pay data reporting, previously under the law, employers who had 100 or more employees had to submit an annual report um, outlining the number of employees at their workplace by race, ethnicity, and sex for each job category, and the number of employees within these defined pay bands. Effective January 1st of this year, uh, employers of the same size, 100 or more employees, now have to also submit a separate pay data report for their temporary workers, uh, which also shows the names of all the labor contractors that the company uses to supply employees. So this is staffing agencies that you would rely on. Uh, and employers have to also report the median and mean hourly rates for each combination of race, ethnicity, and sex for every job category, uh, both for the employer's um, direct hire employees and those supplied through staffing agencies. Uh, there are penalties for an employer's failure to comply with these reporting requirements. Uh, the civil penalty can be up to $100 per employee for the first violation and $200 per employee for each subsequent violation. So it's really important that employers are complying with these new requirements um, because the California Civil Rights Division can enforce this law. So we have some best practices to get into now, and I believe Hannah uh, has some good examples on real world issues that she's encountered uh, with respect to pay transparency. Thank you so much. It's really helpful over, overview, Stephanie. So um, I think the, the biggest takeaway right now when it comes to these, these transparency requirements, the new ones in California and the posting of the range, is that it's really critical for organizations to get as tight and accurate as they can in the range. Um, we're not necessarily there yet at BD, so I'll have a personal example again. I have an open uh, requisition, open role that we're recruiting for. It could be performed in California or potentially in New Jersey. And so because of that, we have to post the uh, range. And the range that we have for this senior council role, which is at the director level, is somewhere in California, is somewhere between 179,000 to 340,000 um, base salary. Um, I can tell you that uh, the starting salary for this role is at the very start of that range. And in part, I think because we have such a broad range, we have been um, really flooded <laughs> with resumes, with interest, because folks understandably see that range and think, oh, well, you know, even very senior attorneys looking at that would say, oh, well, if it's at the higher end, this is going to be great. And so it is a bit of a resource constraint because it means that there's more screening, more conversations that have to happen, and potentially, um, honestly, a little bit of a waste of time for candidates who really wouldn't be interested at the front range and us for trying to figure out who's actually interested given where we really are. So we're certainly on the journey of. Um, getting our ranges a little bit more, a little tighter so that we don't have quite this concern. Um, but it's, we're not there yet. And we also have situations where I think for us, because um, California and Colorado both have requirements that if a role is remote and potentially could be performed in California, then the range has to be disclosed. And we have some um, positions that are field-based that are 
um, going to be sort of territory based, but they're field, they're remote. And as a result, we have to post the range in order to comply with California and Colorado. But there are system limitations um, with how we do that. And in our system, we have to identify sort of the primary site. And if it's not California, the range won't show up. And if it is California, the California range is going to be posted. So for these roles that might be filled um, in Nebraska or Georgia or Texas, they're seeing the California range and the minimum in Nebraska may be actually below, even the maximum may be below our minimum um, in, in California. And so again, we're having to prepare our hiring managers, our recruiters, with talking points to explain um, really what this means for people. We have some, you know, caveat language that's included in the in the postings so that there's at least some hopefully precursor information. So folks won't be completely shocked when we tell them the range is essentially irrelevant for their particular role. But it is a logistical challenge and it's really important to focus on communications. So focusing with the hiring managers, with the recruiting team, so that they are armed with information to share and we're not losing really good candidates because of this sort of clunky early rollout. And also once these scales are posted, your, your employees are going to know, your current employees. And if they are not within that range, then they are going to be asking questions as well. So it's critical that organizations are doing an analysis to see, do we have current employees who are below the range that we're publicizing? And if so, what steps can we take to address that? And in the meantime, knowing none of this can happen overnight, how are we going to arm our managers, our HR partners with the right tools to communicate the reasons for these um, disparities? So communication really is critical in all of these rollouts. Thanks, Hannah, that's great. Um, I know the legislature isn't always taking into consideration the practical impl implications of these laws that they're putting into effect. Um, so, you know, I, I'm sure that there are going to be some hiccups for employers uh, with these new requirements, but, you know, always feel free to reach out to us. We're happy to help. Um, but other best practices, you know, as I've listed here, the requirements under the law, uh, but also don't request an applicant's salary history and don't rely on that salary history uh, when you're hiring them and you're determining their salary. This goes back to the uh, unconscious bias that we were talking about before. Um, you know, we if someone was underpaid at their last position for some reason, we shouldn't continue that um, at somewhere else. So, you know, certainly pay attention to the 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 salary range that's posted within the job and then give the applicant a clean slate and uh, determine their pay based on uh, the bona fide factors that we've discussed. And again, here is just another recap of what's required if you're an employer with 15 or more employees, including the pay scale and your job posting. Uh, but also remember, like Hannah mentioned, if you're uh, working with recruiters or other outside agencies to, uh, to get applicants, then make sure you are communicating the pay scale to them too. Communication is really key in this whole process as Hannah laid out. So here's an overview of pay transparency laws across the country. There are 14 jurisdictions currently currently that have passed pay transparency laws in uh, a handful of others that are on their way, Massachusetts, Montana, South Carolina, and West Virginia. Uh, clearly, California and New York have been the most active in terms of pay transparency legislation, but new laws are popping up all the time. Uh, so we know a lot of you practice in different jurisdictions, so we'll be monitoring that. And this, the map that Michelle posted just kind of showed the progress that we still have to make. We've taken some steps, but there's more to do. Okay, and for your CLE credit for this presentation, the attendance verification code is 8462. That's 8462. And with that, I will hand it back to Michelle. Thanks, Stephanie. Appreciate it. 
Um, so we've talked about now most recent California changes in the law, uh, where we see these changes coming across the nation. Uh, let's talk now about benefits and the effects of pay transparency, uh, particularly with regard to what the implementation looks like. How does it affect your employee workforce? How does it affect retention, uh, performance of your company? Um, so let's start with the benefits. Um, some of these have been covered. Some of them I think are fairly uh, common sense. Uh, we find that engaging in pay transparency and pay equity practices leads to an improved sense of trust and a sense of fairness under, among employees. Uh, it can lead to increased job satisfaction and, and then that translates into an improved performance. Uh, we see that as employees' morale rises, that they're working in a place where they see themselves uh, as a respected part of a whole, where they see a future. Uh, we see that performance rises uh, at the same time that that morale rises among the workplace. We've got a couple of success stories to talk about uh, quickly. Uh, first, uh, looking towards Denmark. In 2006, uh, you know, Denmark was at least a decade ahead of California on this. Uh, Denmark passed the Act on Gender Pay Statistics. Uh, and they required companies of 35 to 50 employees to report gender segregated salary data. Uh, they found that these reporting requirements had some incredible uh, effects in terms of, of shrinking the gender pay gap. Uh, they found that this transparency uh, caused a shrink of 7% uh, among firms and companies that did report their segregated salary data as opposed to no change, right? So what they found was that putting a light on this issue, requiring uh, reporting to the government, requiring uh, a critical lens on these issues did cause change, right? With this act, as well as with California's act, as well as with acts across the nation, there's still room to go, but it's encouraging to see here that the goals of these pay transparency and pay equity laws are played out in practice, uh, that we see that they do cause change and that there's an interruption to this uh, pay equity issue that's so pervasive. A second success story, this one coming to us from the UK. Uh, Verb is a UK-based tech firm. Uh, they allowed all of their employees to access the pay of their peers, supervisors, uh, even those at the very top, including the CEO. Uh, the reason why this transparency was successful for Verb uh, was because they used objective measures, right? They were able to show their employees, here's what your pay scale is, here's what your individual pay is, and here's how we arrived at these numbers, right? Here's the criteria that we're using, their objective. Uh, there isn't the concern that this criteria is based on a membership in a protected class, such as a gender or a gender identity. Um, they were able to show to their employees that they were being paid what they were worth for the job that they were performing. Uh, Ver found that this resulted in no turnover um, and a greater diversity in the workplace, right? we find that people want to work places where they're respected. No great secret in that, right? And so when there's a place where people feel like uh, they can be their whole selves, where that inclusive goal is, is in reach or in place already, um, and that that uh, is being rewarded by fair and equitable pay, uh, they stay where they are. Uh, so an important story in terms of uh, making all of this front-loaded work that we've been discussing, all of this time and effort, uh, it's why it's worth it, right? Beyond the fact of, of our individual dedications towards de &I, we see that there's an incredible uh, success story and progress for businesses on a business level. So taking a, a hard turn now from the benefits and the successes uh, and the reasons why we spend the time to pursue these pay equity issues, uh, let's spend some time now talking about the unintended effects of pay transparency. Um, we find for employers that radical pay transparency or even just complying with the recent laws uh, passed in California can lead to issues of pay compression, uh, right? We've got 
uh, employers who are then forced to pay closer to the higher end of a salary range because they've already got a workforce who's approaching the top end of that salary range. Uh, pay transparency can also result in a demand and supply issue, right? We see employees who are in great demand, who are willing to look outside the company for advancement opportunities, uh, are able to demand higher and higher wages playing into this pay compression issue. Um, and certainly this plays into our company's retention issues, right? Uh, labor retention, attraction of uh, labor talent, it's an ongoing issue across industries. Um, we find sometimes that if employees are easily able to look up uh, a pay range, you know, the, as Anna discussed, something that may be even not particular to their location, it, it may encourage them to start looking at the company and taking their uh, future employment goals elsewhere. Um, you know, we'll talk about these in some more detail. Uh, and we'll particularly talk about these idiosyncratic ideals. Uh, this is when supervisors uh, take it upon themselves to make their direct reports uh, employment more attractive to keep their team in place by offering them some non-monetary uh, non-monetary benefits so that they can combat that retention uh, issue. So let's talk about these. Um, let's talk about some practical ways we would address them. So first we have this issue of pay compression. Um, this is, happens when there's a minimal difference in between tenured employees, your long time, your senior employees, uh, and new hires, or between managers and direct reports, um, or between, uh, for example, your line level managers and your newest employee, right? It becomes an issue when we start having employees review these pay transparency, uh, these pay scales provided to them by pay transparency laws. Uh, when we find that employees are comparing uh, their current pay as compared to their um, coworkers, right? Um, and it, it can lead to issues of dissatisfaction with the job, to people looking to new um, employment opportunities. Um, and we certainly understand the cost of time and money of onboarding a new set of employees. Uh, so we certainly don't want our obligations towards DE&I and towards pay transparency obligations to create for us this separate issue, and that is an incredibly high employee turnover um, or uh, the need for constantly paying at the top of the pay scale. Um, you know, these, these are ongoing issues that we have to address as much as we would like to keep all of the narrative around pay equity positive. Uh, we have to be honest to say, look, sometimes this transparency has a negative impact, including this increased transparency or increased turnover uh, as people begin to question why it is they're earning a particular salary as compared to who they see perhaps as a, a direct competitor or comparator. Um, we mentioned in our sort of overview slide uh, that when this is in place as a systemic issue, uh, that we don't, when we don't have pay scales uh, that have been carefully scrutinized uh, to directly reflect job duties, uh, to directly reflect um, locations, uh, we find that we have supervisors who take matters into their own hands uh, to keep good employees, right? We see that they say, listen, uh, stay here. You may not be able to match a pay scale that you're seeing, um, out with our competitors, but we can offer you some non-monetary issues, something to combat and keep their teams in place. Um, it becomes an issue, right? Because I'm sure this is uh, bring up red flags for, for everyone on the call. When we have these idiosyncratic deals, when we've got uh, pay in terms of condition being implemented differently across departments, across supervisors, uh, it starts to raise an issue for us and a concern about a disparate impact uh, and discrimination concerns. Um, so these are some of our downsides, the unintended consequences of this new pay transparency and pay equity push um, and things that we've got to talk about practically and how we would address that. Uh, so we'll turn to that now. We'll start with Hannah um, with some uh, things that she is, is involved with at BD. Sure, I think some of these, um, these ideals in particular can be really challenging and create a whole host of different issues that 
are even unrelated to pay equity. And um, for example, and this has been an issue I would say since COVID is work location. So perhaps someone is unhappy with their pay and so they'd like to get an increase that we're not able to do for budget reasons, but they say, okay, well then I would like to work from um, Puerto Rico. <laughs> and um, manager says, okay, and maybe that's okay because you're a global uh, employer and you have all of the necessary certifications to do business in Puerto Rico, you have tax set up, you have legal entities that are uh, permitted to do business there. So maybe it's okay from that standpoint, but maybe it isn't. Maybe it's not Puerto Rico. Maybe it's, you know, some island off the coast of the Virgin Islands that we just don't otherwise have uh, authority to do. These are not um, made up examples, by the way. <laughs> so this is a real life stuff. Um, and then the other issue is, okay, so now you have some honestly somewhat random person doing work out of this other location, someone else wants to move and the answer is no, for whatever reason, that job can't be done remotely, can't be done in that time zone, there are performance issues with that person, so we need to monitor. Um, so it can create these really serious um, downstream effects that, that are even broader than the issue that they were trying to address in the first place. Um, we also have seen, um, really well-meaning managers in HR try to come up to creative solutions to deal with these issues. So for example, when I was talking about the remote roles and how it works in our system, if you tag it to a particular location, um, then it's going to trigger the posting of the pay range. And so we had folks saying, well, we'll just post it to a different location. That has nothing to do with where the work is, but in that location, we're not required to post the range or won't have these downstream effects that result in the range being included in the posting, which certainly is not going to work. Um, but it's because they're trying to come up with these creative solutions because otherwise the situation we're in is we have this range that's posted that may have absolutely nothing to do with the actual comp for that, for that role. Um, other things that I see people trying to do is say, well, let's just change the, the the range for that posting. It's not actually our range anymore. It's just a range that's gonna capture what we'll be paying for folks for this particular opening, which then sort of begs into question why you have ranges at all if you're just going to change them you know, depending on your, your feeling or your circumstance or the situation. So it it's it's important, again, I, I know I say communication a lot, but it is important to make sure that there's training for folks um, as your HR teams and your managers are dealing with these requirements, because it's not from any sort of nefarious intent to avoid the law. It is often a really practical minded attempt to address the specific circumstances that don't really fit cleanly into uh, the law um, that, that create unintended downstream impact, impacts that the legislators probably just didn't think through. Um, so making sure that you're having those open dialogues and providing training so that you don't end up finding it out in a lawsuit or a charge about some things that managers in HR did to address some of the issues that come across, um, that come up in these types of laws. Right, really good point. How many times have we said, you know, good intentions have paved the way directly to this lawsuit? Right? I mean, clearly we can understand and we would appreciate supervisors who are proactive and understanding we need to keep good people, right? We need to keep good talent here. Um, but, you know, Helen makes a great point that it should be done really on an organization wide basis, right? It should be done on a uniform, uh, uniform way. Uh, which can be communicated uniformly to employees, right? Because it may be that it's just going to be a fact of life that your pay scale doesn't match your competitors. Um, so how do we fill that gap? Um, you know, I think traditionally the thought was that, you know, money controls, right? Money rules everything around us. Um, but we're finding uh, the new data, particularly a study published by SHRM at the end of last year, which was an incredibly expansive uh, study across uh, many demographics that while money is important, we can't deny that, uh, that there are ways that employers can fill the gaps which make the difference and will help you to retain top talent at your workplace. Um, it's those non-monetary pieces which have grown in importance for our new employees, uh, for employees who reconsidered their priorities after COVID, um, and that is your workplace culture, it's your flexibility, 
right? It's your work-life balance, uh, the programs and processes that you have in place to make sure that you're able to make your uh, workplace an attractive place for your people to work. Certainly, this is a, a great place to return to where we started today, and that is a commitment and a real uh, action towards inclusiveness at your workplace is top. Um, so something to consider about closing those gaps. Um, you know, a way that we may consider uh, addressing these pay gaps when we're looking at this review, we're looking at our pay scales, we're looking about the effect of competition in the workplace, um, you know, consider a pay equity analysis, right? It's a statistical way to identify discrepancies. Uh, take a look at your workforce data, compare employees with similar job functions, and then really sit down and look at it and say, what is, are these numbers showing us? Um, is, do things need to be adjusted? Do we need to look at our structural processes? Uh, do they need to be refined uh, and reviewed for these implicit biases or other issues um, in such a way that could allow us to adjust our pay scale that truly reflects uh, our job duties uh, and our pay, uh, pay scales as they would be uh, truly implemented? Um, Hannah, I know you've had experience with implementing pay equity analysis at your, your workplace. Yeah, and so I mentioned earlier making sure the data is accurate because otherwise your audit is it's only as good as the data going into it is. So making sure that that's covered. Um, and for us, it's helpful to be doing it annually so it's part of our process and that it's, it's easier each time you do it. Um, and there's not... When you start, you may see broader gaps, but if you do it consistently, then any sort of adjustments or additional research that's needed gets smaller and smaller if you're if you're doing the adjustments if they're needed along the way. So keeping that in mind. And of course, engaging great outside counsel like Jackson Lewis to ensure that the audit is done correctly, that it's uh, covered under privilege, because it would be it's very frustrating for employers to spend a lot of money to do the right thing only to have that work thrown in their face in the context of a litigation. So making sure that you're following the steps to, to conduct it in as privileged a way as possible is also really critical. Fantastic segue. <laughs> that brings us to our last um, substantive slide here. Um, and that is a reminder that these pay equity analyses can be a great way to insulate yourselves, uh, to identify any issues, uh, and to mitigate any potential pay equity and discrimination claims, right? Particularly when we're doing it in the way that BD is, right? Which is a continuing annual commitment to reviewing these issues, right? If you can spot them at the beginning, address them in a way which is gonna align with your business objectives, your DE&I commitments, uh, you're gonna go a long way in a lawsuit to be able to say, we are truly a company who takes this seriously and a company who takes action towards our commitment to pay equity, uh, both under the law and just as the company value. Um, and when we think about the ability to say that, we also wrap that back into being a place uh, where women wanna work, right? Being a place where women can thrive and succeed. Uh, when we think back to the uh, mission that International Women's Day uh, brought us to, I think that brings us sort of full circle. Um, so it is an ongoing commitment. You need an action plan, uh, right? It's something that you review with your stakeholders. It's something that you review for D and I obligations and for business uh, business commitments uh, to make sure that you're moving forward in a way that you know is going to let you succeed and let your employees succeed. Um, any last thoughts, Hannah, before we wrap up? No, just thank you to our platinum sponsor, Jackson Lewis, to Michelle and Stephanie for joining us. Thank you to all of those who attended. Um, and, you know, feel free to reach out with questions, but really appreciate everyone's uh, time here. Yeah, thank you so much, Hannah, for joining us. Thank you, everyone, for your time here. Uh, I would love to invite everyone to our first signature event next week. It'll be on March 16th at our new offices. Come see our view. Uh, come watch some of the first games in the March Madness Tournament. We'll have uh, the men's and women's games on. We'll have brackets, the opportunity to win some money. Uh, Chula Vista Brewery will be here. A local winery will be here. It'll be a great chance for us to connect uh, before we move on to the, to the second quarter in our busy lives. So we hope to see you next week, March 16th in our offices. Um, and again, thank you for your time today. We really appreciate it.